Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the final part of our Opus 12 set review. Uh, I'm joined, as always, by Travis Pfeiffer. Hey, Alex. Thanks for having me here. Uh, today, we're going to be doing those much-awaited uh, multi-element cards, as well as uh, light and dark. So all, all the cards in the set, I think we're about three short from what they normally are, but we got three multi-elements for a lot of them. So there will be plenty here to dig into. Yes, and the multi-element cards are, are pretty much all like boosted power levels, so they look really good. Um, so I'm super excited to talk about them. But first, before we get to the multi-elements, we have to talk about the one light card and the one dark card that we got. So I'm gonna start us off uh, by talking about Lena. So Lena is a three CP uh, light forward um, job warrior of light, which is super important, um, I think at least. Uh, when Lena uh, enters the field, place one arise counter on her for each backup you control. And then when a backup enters the field, you can also put another arise counter onto Lena. And then you can dull her and remove however many arise counters that you want from her and then she's a forward in your break zone and then if its cost is the same as the amount of counters you took off you played onto the field so this is really cool and and you think about it and the the most logical move is you know if you have five backups you get five counters and then you can play a five cost by dulling her uh or you could play a three cost on the first turn and a two cost on the next turn or you could play five one costs over five turns or five activations, which is super exciting, right? Uh, and then if you play her early, you get less counters, but maybe you can st stack them on. It's a little more risky, uh, but it's still it's still really cool. Um, I, I think the key is going to be replaying this card because I think that ETB is where it's at. So if you let this die or you sacrifice it, you fanfret it. Uh, and then you try to like phoenix it back or something. Uh, I think that's where you're, you're going to get some really cool value. Uh, but it has to survive long enough to be able to dull to do its arise thing. So that's important. That's that's very important. Uh, one last note: we got uh, the Gestalion Empire said last set uh, that puts more counters on things, but they have to be monsters. So that's unfortunate because that would have been a really cool way. And I don't even think overpowered to put counters on her. Uh, and you're going into a way different element than what Lena is usually in. So it's a shame that that doesn't work on her. Uh, but overall, a very, very cool card. Uh, and I'm, I'm unsure of how to raid it. I think it's slow and takes setup, but could be very powerful. Yeah, again, it's got some potential. I agree. I think you're pretty much just getting the ETB offer. It's hard to see a world where you're like constantly putting backups into the field to mm -hmm. keep building up the triggers. Um, again, there's just always this disparity between light and dark that the dark cards are always, hey, I'm just great on my own and like don't require any setup. And you have this card that has it has some cool features to it, but it's just it, it, it's kind of a one fire. Once mm -hmm. you get that first arise, you're probably not getting it again. Uh, it's really easy to disrupt that if they can mess with your break zone and she doesn't have haste. And so she has to dull. So again, she's got to sit out there for a full turn. Um, and in Warriors of Light, I'm going to try her in Warriors of Light. Only thing is, Warriors of Light already has so many good light cards. There's the mm -hmm. one that reduces damage by 2k. There's the guy that flips five off the top, Refia. And I'm just like, oh my god, I can't play all these light cards. Like, I have to be able to pitch CP. So I don't even know how well it's going to go in there. That said, I, I, what I do like about at least this legend, light legend compared to some of the past ones almost all the past ones are super specific of like it has to go in this single deck whereas this one is actually pretty universal you can mm -hmm. pretty much jam this on any deck you want um so she does read a little better than that but overall i have a feeling she's gonna be too slow to be super great but hey maybe i'll be wrong i'm, I'm really excited to try her because she can be played in any other deck uh, but yeah. she has to survive. Like if you played her in a lightning deck and gave her haste, then she could revive right away. And yeah. but like that's so much setup. So yeah, I think um, I think she's gonna be super fun and so thematic, so cool to play with. Yeah. Um, but uh, competitive, I'm not so sure. Gorgeous artwork. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of which. Speaking of which, uh, this card, that's probably the best part about this card is the artwork, at least from my very biased perspective. Um, all right, next, this is a six cost, 10,000 power forward job none. Uh, that is to say N-O-N-E, not that he doesn't have a job. Uh, this is from Mobius category five. This is Neo X-Death. 
Neo X Death is also card name X Death in all situations. At the end of each of your opponent's turns, your opponent selects one character they control. Put it into the break zone. When Neo X Death is chosen by your opponent's summons or abilities, your opponent selects one character they control. Put it into the break zone. So this card is just ridiculous. Like, it feels like power levels are just kind of goofy these days. Like, he's just 10,000. Like, that's so hard to deal with unless you have some kind of straight break effect. But this card is just, he's a time bomb because the moment he comes down, he's like, you have to deal with me or you're losing characters every turn. Or if you even try to deal with me, if you actually choose me, you're going to lose characters anyway. Like, there's been a lot of hubbub about this card because if someone puts this down against you turn one, and you don't have an immediate answer, what do you do? No, I genuinely mean that. What mm. do you do? Because you can't even, like, curve out backups because you have to then throw them away. Like, so what do you do? Do you just discard your, your uh, two cards and pass, like, hoping to draw an answer? Like, I, 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 this kind of design, it, it's like they think, well, in the situation where you, you have an instant answer to this card, he's not very strong. Well, yeah, but that's most cards. Like, what about all those situations you don't have that instant answer, which happens all the time? Again, what do you do in that you're just screwed? Does that sound fun, losing the game before you've even drawn a card to, for your turn? That doesn't sound fun to me. And that's just the turn one Neo X deck. If this guy comes down later, again, he's getting some kind of value for you, because even if they answer him immediately, they're going to lose something in return. And if they don't answer him, he's this massive body that just says, hey, by me existing, you just lose cards every turn. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy. Yes, there are a few clean counters to him. A Zalira, if he's dull, uh, doesn't choose. So that will get around him safely. A Famfred, if he's the only forward on the field. So yes, there. but again, in general, and this is why Braska's final Aeon was such a terror in the last opus and why Dottaluma before him. Most of the effects in this game are choose a forward, choose something. So when they make these cards that say, hey, by the very act of you choosing me, you're hurting yourself. Like, it's just crazy, man. This card's insane. Heaven help you if you draw this in limited or sealed because if your opponent slams this on you again, I don't know what you do. I think you, you just lost the game there. Like, he's crazy. I don't like him. And go away. Great art, though. I do love the art. Looks great. Yeah. So, um, I mean, he's worse than Veritas if you do target him right away because you only lose sure. one thing. Uh, so that's something to note. So if you play him late later in the game, I feel like he's worse the longer the game goes on because the it might, it's more likely your opponent has an answer for him, and and that's where it's kind of like tricky because he's so expensive. Um, so like. If, if your opponent removed a Veritas while they're removing a character, they're choosing a character to remove or selecting a character, um, but that Veritas came in and removed a Ford, so it got you twice. This thing's only gonna get you once if you remove it the turn that you came in. So as the longer the game goes on, one, you'll have more removal, two, you have more characters that you feel comfortable removing. Um, so it does get weaker as the game goes on and it's harder to play because it's so expensive. Uh, so I'm curious if playing it early is like if that because like you said it could completely ruin a game for a player but then if the player does answer you it could completely ruin the game for you and is that going to be too streaky for tournament play and if it is then people will be dissuaded from playing this card because like if you could imagine playing this uh, turn one with four cards from hand and then someone answers with like a Famfrit. And you're just, you're the one now that's whose game's been ruined and you're the one that's just gonna lose to your opponent. So uh, that's how I, it's gonna be a big if uh, for me on that one. Uh, it does seem quite strong early on for sure. Thought about that, but like even in that situation, un unless they get the unit down to make the Famfrit cheaper, they're pitching three cards to put that Famfrit down. Um, which and you pitched four, so yeah, they're ahead by a single card, but that's it. It's not like you junked your entire hand and now they've got a full grip. They pitched nearly as many cards. That's the thing is that unless it's something like the cheap Fenrir, anything, any summon or anything you immediately answer this with, you're going to be throwing out nearly as many cards as they will. So that's kind of the worry is that even if they do that, I don't think it's like oh your game's over now. It's like oh okay, well I guess we'll just restart and go again kind of thing. Nah, I think it's definitely not let's restart and go again because you also passed initiative. So like, for example, if you yeah. went if you went second or say if you're going first in the scenario, you've essentially told them you've gone a card down. Uh, you drew one less card than them 
and you essentially gave them first turn because the whole reason that a, a person that goes first gets one less card is because going first is uh, better. So uh, uh, m most of the time, uh, that is. Um, so you've just passed initiative and you're you're down one card already for having gone first. So it is a bigger swing than it's made out to be. But uh, I do agree that it's it's probably too strong early on, and that's concerning to me. I, I, I would love nothing more than to be wrong about this mm -hmm. card. Yeah. I wasn't wrong about Braska's, and I wasn't wrong about Kadaj. So trust me, I hope at the end of this opus, I was like, whoo, thank goodness we dodged that bullet. But I've got a feeling this thing's going to be just a terror. Mm -hmm. uh, agreed. Okay, next up, we've got our multi-element cards. Uh, and the first one we're going to talk about is Vayne. Uh, Vayne is a uh, 3 CP fire and ice card. Uh, job console, category 12. 8,000 power. When If you control four more fire characters, Vayne uh, gains 2,000 power, and he is a fire character, so you just need three. If you control four or more ice characters, and he's ice character, he gains when Vayne attacks your opponent, discards one card from their hand. And I think you mentioned this in the ice video, Travis, that uh, discarding on swing is super, super powerful. It's it's a crazy effect, and it's that's awesome. Uh, so we're looking at... A slow card because you have to set up multiple elements but once you do playing him is easy because obviously he's in a multi-element card uh, and then he becomes this really strong uh, 10k that no one's gonna block and because uh, sometimes with these cards that discard they're so weak that the deterrent from you swinging to make them discard or, or damage is that you'll throw your forward away but that's not gonna happen with him uh, or if you play him in an uh, mostly ice stack. Uh, I mean, an 8k, 3 CP 8k is nothing to, to shake a stick at either. So, I mean, he might just be swinging just for the ice effect. The fire effect might not be that important. I don't know. It seems really good. He seems really strong. And actually, you just made him even better to me because w when I read this, I forgot that he counts himself. So I was like, oh, that's hard. You got to have four other people besides Vayne. No, you only need to have three. So if you have three ice backups, two fire backups and a single other fire forward all of his effects are online um now granted you could say okay well maybe that's still kind of hard to do but it's easier than i first thought because at mm -hmm. first i was like oh you gotta have four people besides me no he counts himself for both of those uh and yeah just an on discard swing is like you said you know lock and genesis are generally kind of weak but they have that thread they hit you nah he doesn't even need to hit you he just has to attack in so i think this guy's got a lot of potential he kind of scares me yeah, big time. Uh, okay, now we got our first multi-element legend. This is exciting. Yeah, this is Celtius Fire Ice. Uh, Job Kulu. He is from Final Fantasy XI. He's a four-cost, seven thousand power forward. When Celtius enters the field, remove up to five fire forwards and or ice forwards in your break zone from the game. Then reveal the top five cards of your deck. Play one forward of cost equal to or less than the number of removed cards among them onto the field and then return the other cards to the bottom of your deck in any order. When this guy first came out, I really liked him. The more I read him, I honestly like him a little less and less. He just seems, again, he's, he's got one of those specific things. You gotta have five forwards in the break zone. If you're playing I, Fire Ice, he, they're gonna fit that requirement. And then it's up to you to, re to decide how many to get rid of, but chances are you're probably going to go for all five because you want the highest chance possible to hit a forward, um, which means you then have to hit a forward of, of five or less within those next five cards. And w while in general, if you design a deck around it, um, cards that reveal off the top of the deck are usually pretty consistent as far as like luck things go, but there's still plenty of times I've totally whiffed on them. And then if you whiff on this guy, he doesn't do anything. You know, he's just a, an undercurve body at that point. But if you hit and you get a nice five cost that comes onto the field for free, that will feel great. Um, he's a little too eh for me, a little too unreliable. But I, I, I can definitely, I, I, I could see being wrong about this guy and being like, whoa, he's crazy good. Yeah, I, I think he's, I think he's fairly strong. And I mean, I just think of playing Genesis and Locke with this. Uh, would just be crazy and I also think there's a lot of stuff about revealing top cards and, and you know like okay if I want to hit um, a sky pirate how many sky pirates do I need to run to reveal one off yeah. the top of my deck there's a lot of stuff about that this won't be difficult because 
you you basically like hypothetically if you're right, running forwards of five costs or less in your deck you just have to hit a forward um yeah and fire and ice uh runs a lot of really great forwards so i think this is way easier to hit than the typical reveal off the top of your deck uh, but then it's again it's slow because you need to have these fire and or ice forwards in the break zone before his effect can be live so uh yeah i think i think he's just like i think he's just a fair legend that could be very powerful and sometimes won't be and won't be able to come out right away but uh definitely a very uh a very cool legend and a very interesting legend too if you can play him multiple times you start running out of forwards or something or yeah one to watch for sure yeah especially if we ever get removed from the game synergy yeah yeah uh okay um it's me again <laughs> I, got, I got confused yeah. uh, it's leon uh so leon is a two cp fire ice forward uh job rebel uh 7k so he's over curve which is super nice uh he's a common when leon enters the field select one of the two following actions and most of the multi-element cards that are commons and rares have this text uh select one of two options from their their two uh themes their two elements so he can choose one for dull or freeze it i love that uh choose one for deal it three thousand damage that's the fire one so it's indiscriminate damage uh, i mean this is really cool utility i i don't see a huge use for it but then again um the utility of like dulling or freezing something is kind of very it's that's that's nice for sure unless you really want the the ability to discard for either element that this card gives you mm -hmm. uh there's just so many forwards that do these effects are better already yeah like kind of for similar costs so i'm not really big on him there i, I do like his artwork there I, I like how pouty he looks he's like so i know I love to people made fun of it and i'm just like no this is amazing this is like the best artwork in yeah. the game hands down 10 out of 10 i love it <laughs> sorry ultros like the ultros and then leon sure and then like and the then maybe neo x death yeah maybe maybe yeah i do like that the musical notes are, are like different colored too to match the elements so yeah i mean he's fine he's fine for a common absolutely uh okay now we've got a rare that had a lot of people talking rare are you sure this isn't a legend <laughs> uh this is one of the leaders of the factions from final fantasy 10 technically 10 2 but category 10 job praetor uh this is barrel eye he's a three cost seven thousand power forward ice wind when one or more dull backups you control is activated due to your summons or abilities deal three thousand damage to all the forwards opponent controls when your opponent discards one or more cards from your hand, their hand due to your summons or abilities, choose a character, dull it and freeze it. <laughs> this card's crazy. I remember, I'll never forget the way the, the, the chat, the chat, my messenger blew up yeah. the morning this guy got revealed in my group. Because it's just like, what? And what's crazy is everyone was talking about that first effect. I'm going to mention the second effect because the second effect's nuts. Anytime they discard, dull freeze a character. So you can cast Glacialabolus and say, hey, uh, discard one and we'll deal that 7k. Oh, and by the way, since you now discarded, go ahead and dull freeze that key backup or monster or whatever forward I want. Or Zidane, one of the best cards in the game, Opus 3 Zidane comes in, says, let me look at that hand. I'll pull that out, throw it away. By the way, I've now just dull frozen that backup you needed. Bye. And no one was even talking about that effect because the first effect, Anytime you a dull backup reactivates 3k board damage. <laughs> what? Look up the Guido combo if you want to know about that. I'm not going to go into it here. But I mean, Diabolos, Valifor, Pandemonium. I mean, think what you could cast Pandemonium with Barely on the field, and it's going to do 5,000 damage for one CP. Or <laughs> if you're there at five damage, you're doing 7k for one. That's crazy. Like, there's already so many ways to reactivate stuff. I'm definitely doing an Ice Wind Chocobo deck with the no-no backup that reactivates when you attack. So it's, hey, every time one of these Chocobos attacks, 3k damage to the board. This guy's nuts. He's so, he's so nuts. Like, you better hope you have an instant answer in hand for him because he doesn't create a stack when he enters. So, like, uh, he just, wow. Damn, this card reads strong. Yeah, I, I agree. It looks really, really cool. I wonder um, if there's ever going to be a time where, like, you're not ready for him you haven't assembled your pieces yet and then you have to play him and you lose value for him just being a vanilla 
uh, the, the key's not over curved like the other multi elements. Um, so I wonder if that's going to be a loss at times, but I think it's well worth the risk because if you set up your deck properly to work with him, he's going to be incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, we've got. Riku, which is a two CP Ice Wind forward uh, job gullwing. Uh, and when Riku enters the field, select one of two of the following actions. Choose one character, dull it. Choose two characters, activate them. So this is super interesting um, because it's characters. Uh, that's nice to do dull forward or backup. Uh, and it's nice that she can pay for herself with whatever type of backups you have out if you wanted to just go um, super... Um, uh, I guess like value, uh, but then she could also just she can be used. Like I'll see her being used uh, with the card we just mentioned, uh, but then also um, just used to activate all sorts of combos where you need to activate either forwards or you need to activate backups. Uh, like she's she's got more utility than Leon does. That's for sure. Yeah, I would agree with that. At the same time, I just feel very underwhelmed by her. I don't know why, because again, I can see potential. A card that potentially is free is never a bad thing. Um, and Dolan, again, it's a character. If it was just forward, it would really read underwhelming. But Dolan, a character, can always be useful. But I don't know. I, I, maybe I'm underselling this card. But, I, again, I guess there's just so many things that do mm. that. I'm like, okay, so why am I playing this over those? Like, I don't know. Maybe it's, I'm the, wrong. it's the choose two characters, activate them. That's super intriguing to me. Yeah. yeah that's I the agree. one that yeah. I, I think it's not going to be. This isn't a staple that you just put in a deck. But I think those really crazy deck builders that try to make uh, cool combos, this is the type of card that is that card that they need in their deck. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, putting this in with Barrel Eye on the field. Hey, let me put a free body that just did 3K to your board. Bye. <laughs> All right, moving on. All right, our final ice win. This is our legend. Uh, this is Locke from Final Fantasy VI, uh, also the City of Final Fantasy category. Job Treasure Hunter. He is an 8 cost, 9,000 power forward. The cost required to cast Locke is reduced by 2 for each card you have cast this turn. However, it cannot become 1 or less. When Locke enters the field, select up to 2 of the 4 following actions. Your opponent discards 1 card choose up to two characters, dull them and freeze them, choose a forward of cost six or more, break it, choose a monster, break it. When this card first came out, I was, wasn't was super high on it, because I was like, oh, it's kind of expensive, and I was like, eh, six or more, monster, I was like, I don't know how great that is, but he has two, what I kind of just call like universal effects, which is the discard and the dull freeze two characters, pretty much you're never going to miss those like that's almost always going to be relevant whereas the other two are a little more situational and then the fact that he can get cheaper based on that if you put out any other cards this turn um is just makes him even more value and i think the real key thing about this card is that i don't think it's terrible to pay eight for this to pay eight cp for a big body to make them discard or to dull freeze or, or hell if you take out a neo x death or some big character like that's more than worth it. So I think that alone, the fact that it's not terrible if you have to pay eight for this and then you can only potentially get him cheaper. Oh my, this comes down for two. Woo! Good game, baby. Well, you know, if you play Riku before this, Riku just reactivates the backups. Boom, that's one cast. Okay, then you play Vada. You know, if you're playing like four wind and one ice and then, you know, splash ice. Uh, you play Bart's, whatever it is. Like, there's your all your efficient uh, cards coming in, and then you play Lock. Uh, that that's pretty pretty cool. Um, I don't know if I'm there yet on the. He's okay at eight CP. I, I think I need to see it more. But I'm I'm not personally not there. Uh, but I think at six or lower, obviously he's really good. Um, super great effects. Super strong card. Yeah. Great. I forgot to put it on screen. Oh my god! There's the card for you guys. Uh, so Locke's now on screen. He's right there. Okay. Uh, moving right along. I'll just have to edit that later. Uh, okay, moving along, we have Iris. So Iris is a 4CP uh, uh, forward, uh, Wind and Earth, which is one of her combinations. And uh, she is a Lucian subject category 15. So Travis is all about that, Iris. Um, when Iris enters the field, choose up to two Wind backups you control and up to two Earth backups you control. Activate them. So she's like Vada, where she can come in for free, but you need to have a little more um, difficulty setting up because you need backups of multiple elements. But then but then she gets these extra effects that are so cool. She gets one air, uh, one wind, one earth, uh, select one of the two following actions. She can give herself 2K, 
uh, or she can make herself unblockable by forwards of cost 9,000 power or more. Both very cool utility effects, uh, and that makes her a better Vada because Vada is just the vanilla forward once he's out, uh, and she is so much more than that. Yeah, she's well. Cate- okay, let's let's see what boxes this checks. Category fifteen character, a, a brand new one that hasn't existed in the game yet. Check. One of my favorite characters from the game. Check. Can be free on entry. Check. Action ability that actually doesn't have a limit, so you can use it as many times as you pay for it. Double check. Fits an Earth Lightning. Oh no, so close. Why is she wind? I've wanted an Iris card for so long. When there's a Noctis we're gonna talk about. When that was revealed, and that was revealed first. I was like, why isn't that Iris? Oh, it should be Iris. And then Iris came out. I was like, oh, that- oh, but she's in wind. <laughs> okay, so in Earth Wind, I think she's got a lot of potential. Alex covered her effects perfectly. Just why? How do I fit this into a 15 deck? Like it's Earth and Lightning, and then they mm-hmm. want me to put Luna Freya into water, like. I don't know how I get her in there. They're messing with you. They're messing Um, with you. Yeah, this is just to agitate me. Minus my sorrow that I'm going to struggle to fit her into a 15 deck. Cool card. I love the way she reads. All right, let's let's put Iris out of sight and out of mind. Hi, baby. Okay, next up we have Prish, because there aren't enough Prish cards in the game. Prish is, as always, the abhorrent one, a two-cost, 7,000 power forward from Final Fantasy XI, also uh, City of Final Fantasy category. When Prish enters the field, select one of the two following actions. You may choose a forward until the end of the turn. It gains 1,000 power and brave, or choose a monster of cost three or less, break it. Uh, yeah, it's fine. I mean, I've always said eventually they're going to have a backup Prish come out that says you can play as many different versions of Prish on the field as you want. It'll just be like the self-contained <laughs> Prish title deck, but it's unconstructed. Um, beyond that, uh, 1k Brave, so many cards have that. Break a monster. Eh, I don't know. I'm not, I don't really care for this one. I, I think... Called, again, in a Prish deck, maybe it's just more Prish fodder, but... I, I think that if there's... Um... If, if we have a lot of monsters in the meta, then I'm going to run the heck out of this because you get so much utility. Like, for example, I, I used to run a lot uh, of the Psycom Enforcer, which is a 3 CP 7K Earth Forward, uh, just, to, just to break Cactars and stuff. Uh, and and that, was, that was so important in certain matchups. So to have a card that's cheaper than that with, uh, with the bonus effect of they're not running monsters or they don't have a monster out yet, you get this other effect. Uh, I mean, it's just objectively a strong card. Is it going to be putting, sure. put into every deck? I don't think so. Uh, but I think that it's just such a lovely tech card to have. It's definitely welcome. And the fact that it's 11 and, and that makes it uh, also yeah. searchable in another way, then that that's cool too. So so I, I, do, I do like it. Okay. Uh, now we've got another one of Travis's favorite uh, archetypes to play, and it's in the perfect element for him. Uh, this is Yishtola, uh, Sign of the Seventh Dawn, 3 CP, Wind, Earth, Forward, 9K Power, holy, uh, f- category 14. She's got haste. And it says, if Yishtola has dealt damage less than her power, the damage becomes zero instead. So she's got Minwu effect. And then she can't be blocked by a forward uh, of cost four or more. So um, let's see. Haste. Okay, that's wind. Uh, you know, can't be blocked. Uh, that's wind. Uh, can't be dealt damage less than her power. That's water. What? That doesn't make any sense. This is a water wind card, but it's not. It's, a, it's an earth wind card. Uh, I guess the earth part is that she's strong uh, with the 9k. That's so crazy. Like, she's got a lot. Uh, I pulled this during pre-release, and it was obviously very, very good in the limited environment. And I think it's going to be good in the constructed environment. <laughs> Three positive effects above curve body under costed. Like, wh- wh- what more do you want? I-, I guess you could argue that first effect is is wind in the sense that, like, the forward Aerith had it. She had that damage reduction. Yeah. And there were a lot of backups, like Cactar Conductor and stuff, that would reduce damage to zero. So wind has had stuff Okay, like that that's before. fair. That's fair. Um, but yes, I, of course, I think I'm Minwoo too. Yeah, I guess the Earth effect that she's a big body because those, I mean, just three positive effects. Haste? Like, you don't even need Alisei. Alisei's like, I'm coming, Sion. She's like, no, no, no. Alisei, take, take a seat. I- I've got this. <laughs> I don't actually need you out. Like, this card is just crazy. Like, yeah, if you're playing Earth Wind, I don't see why you wouldn't do this. A- and think about that. She can't be blocked by four or more. How many three cost or under forwards do you know that have 9k power? 
Not a whole lot. There's, there's a few, like Borgen and, you know, like that, uh, the Forza guy we saw. So there's a couple, but for the most part, she's, it's like, I dare you to block me. And even if you do, eh, no worries, I didn't take any of that damage. Like, uh, Ishtola has some, I like the character in, 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 in uh, 14 fine and all, but I, I guess she's super loved because man, she is, she yeah. Just always get grand cards, like it's crazy. She wins a lot of popularity contests, and I don't mean that in like a uh, ironic, like or like a making fun sense. Like no, like actual polls, like popularity polls. She wins a lot of those. Uh, so a couple, a couple other things I want to mention. Um, the first is I want to shout out Yuda for my locals. That when he, the first thing he said when he saw this was, I actually wish it had brave instead of haste. Um, and I kind of get that because there aren't that many Wind Earth decks that are very aggressive. Um, so this doesn't actually like power any Wind Earth's strategy. Like it doesn't hurt them necessarily, but it doesn't also like power their strategy. So, uh, you know, having a brave 9k that can block, that would have been really cool too. And it would have given it, evened out the Earth Wind effects a little bit. Um, and then the other thing is that obviously there's a name clash. As you mentioned, there's a lot of other Yishtolas in the game. Uh, and this is going to block you out from using the other legend Yishtola, which is a really big deal. So uh, can you afford not to run that one? Uh, well, I guess, uh, I guess we'll have to find out. That's probably this card's only weakness is mm -hmm. that, yeah, it, it clashes with one of the strongest Opus 5 legends there is, so still, she's a beast. And equally as strong, next we have... Shantoto! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, Shantoto is a 2 CP, 7,000 power forward, Earth Lightning, Job Mage, from Final Fantasy XI, the City of Final Fantasy. Uh, she reads, when she enters the field, select one of the two following actions. You can choose a forward other than Shantoto. It gains haste until the end of the turn. There's your lightning. Or you can choose a forward you control. It gains this forward cannot be broken until the end of the turn. There's your earth. Giving something haste is never bad, so the lightning part's mm -hmm. kind of appealing, but really it's the earth effect that appeals to me. In particular, the idea that, like, she's a two-cost, so you can bring this back with Phoenix, and she'll just cancel out your opponent's attack phase because they can't break whatever forward she gives that to, she can just make it a break, and she can choose herself, so you can have no forwards on the board. Phoenix, here comes Shantoto, block, 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 all day long. Um, yeah, that's a really good effect. I think this one will come down to space, and like the last one, terrible, terrible name clash, because there's so many good Shantotos, whether it's the backup board clear one, the nine cost one that's going to take something out. Um, so if you're, you know, but then again, Lightning doesn't really have one, so maybe if you're having something a little more Lightning-focused, this card will be really good, but it's got some good value for what it does. See, so I'm actually the opposite camp of you. I'm like, ah, yeah, you know, like the, the this forward can't be broken is kind of a neat effect, but man, that haste, that's where I'm at. Uh, because giving Earth forwards haste could be um, an, <clears throat> an unexpected way to win out a uh, game. If people don't expect that you have haste. Uh, and then we have things like Fenrir that can play this. So that's yeah. really interesting because Phoenix, I mean, that's another color, but Fenrir, you're already playing that. So this, yeah, that's a great point. Um, this can go into mono earth because earth has so many color fixing methods uh, that I think having this as a way to give haste to a mono earth deck could be intriguing to say the least. That's a good point. I forgot about Fenrir. That actually bumps us up quite a bit in my, in my mind. Now, do you want to take the next one? Cause it's your, your boy or. Uh, no, you go ahead. I'll, okay. I'll get my cup. Next up, we've got Noctis. Uh, he is a uh, 3 CP Earth Lightning forward 7k power, category 15, job prince. Uh, when Noctis enters the field, choose one category 15 forward other than card named Noctis in your break zone, add it to your hand. So he's already a amazing recursion engine. That's just super good. Uh, it makes him nice and cheap. When Noctis forms a party and attacks until the end of the turn, all forwards gain 2,000 power, all your forwards. And then haste. That's crazy. That's, I mean, and, and that's cool because once he's out, you can just set that up. So um, if you just play out a couple of forwards uh, and then go to combat phase and they're not prepared to deal with you, as soon as Noctis swings, you're swinging with power and you've just hasted your board. It seems crazy. Um, it does obviously require setup, but at the same time, he's bringing the cards back into your hand so that you can play them so that he can haste them. So I think this card's awesome. I really like it. And, and, and we're kind of coming back to the same thing again, that name clash, right? Like we're getting these name clashes on all these good cards and that's no accident. 
Don't make me choose. Don't make me choose. I actually run both of the other Noctis in my 15 deck, the two cost board and the three cost board, both of which have a burst. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to take one of those out for him because uh, he does such a different effect. But he still would fit because he pulls back a 15 card on entry. And so the interesting thing about his second effect is it really does require a setup. Because here's the thing. To make that relevant, to give your other forwards haste, it has to have been a forward that... Because haste is only relevant the turn a forward enters the field. After that, they can attack anyway, mm -hmm. so haste is meaningless. So what it means is you have to have had Noctis and another forward on the field, and then you had to have played at least one new forward that turn, hopefully two. Have Noctis and the other two go in, boom, it busts the other ones up. Now, that is a lot of setup. Some people, I think, were kind of overrating this. They're like, oh, this is easy. I'll just have haste everything. I was like, yeah, eh, oh, yeah. No, you have to have this kind of specific setup. But that does happen, and they all just go in, and your boy Ignis is out there giving them all brave, and it's like, go ahead, that's it. I've come up with a new attack type. Dude, yeah, you're going for days. Can't wait to test it. It's going to be a struggle to, to, to which Noctis I'm going to pull out for it, but gives parties fun stuff. Yeah, everything about him reads great. Yeah, I actually think... Uh, um... It, it is a lot of setup. Uh, I actually, I, don't, I think I forgot to read that party part of it. Um, but what I do like is that um, if you get them out early, it's like a, it's just such a good early play um, because it puts a lot of pressure on your opponent as soon as you, you start yeah. playing more forwards. But if they remove him, he didn't cost you so much. So like they're yeah. gonna lose out that CP battle on their removal versus you playing him. So like that just makes him so good to me. So I definitely I definitely want to try this. I almost want again try this in um in like a mono earth deck, 14 uh, 15 deck. And then yeah. just have splash like for him. Uh, and for the next card. Which is sticking with the 15 theme. Oh, so much 15 love. I love it. This is his father, King Regis. Job King, category 15. He is a five cost, 8,000 power forward. When Regis enters the field, choose up to two forwards other than card name Regis or a light or dark uh, put into your break zone from the field during this turn. Play them onto the field. He has a special Royal Sigil, which is one Regis, an Earth, a Lightning. All the forwards you control gain. This forward cannot be broken until the end of the turn. This card is so cool. Mm -hmm. uh, even if he ends up not being as great as we all think he's going to be, like he's just a cool card. Um, I love the Royal Sigil. It's great that it can be done on your opponent's turn. Again, basically skipping their attack phase. Just say, yeah, attack all you want. You're not breaking any of these guys. That's fantastic. Um, and then his entry effect is, is great because it's this massive swing play. But again, it's an effect I like. You have to think about it. You, you can't just... You, you actually kind of have to plan because... You've got to go in, okay, maybe these guys, I'll throw them into combat, and then that way if they die, I'll bring them back with Regis. Oh, they didn't block. Okay, uh, now I can't bring them back. Okay, i got to do something different now. So again, you can't just throw this out whenever. You have to think about it. He, you're probably going to do him as a main phase two card. But again, there's so many fun combos. Maybe you do a Famfrit combo where you Famfrit two away your guys, bring in Regis, boom, they come right back. Some people have mentioned that new Legend Gilgamesh. Maybe you break the Gilgamesh. Hey, mm. guess what? He's coming right back in main phase two. Like... Such a cool card, great artwork. Nice to see 15 get some more love. Honestly, I want to run him in the 15 deck, but it's going to be hard because the backup searcher Regis is really good too. But man, 15 title is looking sweet. Yeah, this card is nuts. Uh, this this harkens back to uh, the vanilla Hearthstone days when uh, everyone was playing Kel'Thuzad. That was like the legend because you could get it from free for free. Uh, so if you got Naxxramas, so like everybody had this card and everybody was playing it, and it was the same thing at the end of your turn. Kel'Thuzad brought everybody back. Uh, so you were just having these crazy matches where like things were rising from the dead. So I think of that when I look at this card and I love being able to attack with Fords knowing that I have a backup plan because it's always like, great, I, I in this scenario, if you block, I'm good. If you don't, I'm good because I can just play it as aggressive as I want. And this card enables that. So I love it and I want to play this card. Can't wait. Mm -hmm. Okay, next up, we've got uh, another Sign of the Seventh Dawn. This is Uriange. He is a forward, uh, 7k. Uh, Lightning Water is our next element pairing. When Uriange enters the field, you may play one monster of cost two or less from your hand onto the field. And when you do so, choose one forward your opponent controls, return it um, to its owner's hand. So this gets you... Uh, 
again, um, it gets you some value on entry, uh, but then it also has some value like in terms of bouncing. Like it's it's cool. So I actually don't see this at all being in a regular science deck. I think you'd probably still run the old Urian J. Uh, I think this is just like it's kind of a tease because it has the science job, but really it's its own card that just goes into a lightning water deck that can do some cool stuff. Like about him is that you have so you have to have that monster in hand. Like whereas the mm -hmm. old Orianje, a common thing you do is I'll pitch like the dragon, bring him out to the field, and boom, it pulls the dragon back from the break zone. This one you have to have the monster in hand, and if you don't have a monster, you actually can't bounce a forward. So mm -hmm. if you don't have a monster to play with this guy, he's just blank. So that definitely makes him, I think, a little uh, just kind of more situational. Mm -hmm. um, depending on the situation, if you have the monster in hand, hey, you're you're all gravy. But if you don't, or it was in the break zone, that was kind of the nice thing about you know the other one. You could pitch a monster early, knowing you would pull it back. So yeah, that kind of makes me a little eh on him. I'd have to try him to be sure, but I, I can see the potential. Again, it's a good swing play of hey, my body, here's my monster, and then you lose a body. So. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the way to think about it is that it's a huge swing play when it goes off. But I think if we're going to be honest about all the multi-element cards that we've seen, this is probably one of the weaker ones. Yeah. Uh, okay, why don't you take us to our next big reveal? All right. Sticking with our Shadowbringer Scions theme, we have Thancred from a job Scion of the Seventh Dawn, category 14, a seven cost, 8,000 power forward. When Thancred enters the field, choose one forward in your break zone. If its cost is equal to or less than the number of water forwards and or water backups you control, play it onto the field. When Thancred attacks, choose one active forward opponent controls. If its cost is equal to or less than the number of lightning forwards and or lightning backups you control, break it. I have no idea what to think about this card. And I've read a lot of opinions, and I've heard a lot of opinions, and I've heard very differing ones, and they're all compelling. I've, mm -hmm. I've, I can see the potential of this guy being brutal, of this guy actually being like an insane legend that just destroys you when he comes in, because he can get this free forward onto the field, and he's breaking something when he attacks, and he got Ali say, and he goes in with haste. Then I've also seen the other side. Oh, he's 8K, so he dies to Amaterasu on his entry. It requires you to have a large amount of both water and lightning if you want to get both effects off. So you just you just lean towards one or the other. So I really, I honestly don't know what to think about this card because again, I, I can see both sides. I can see he could be insane. He has such upside, but I can also see it's just so much you got to do to like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I I think I yeah, that's that that's definitely. Um... That's definitely a tough one with Amaterasu. Uh, I do like that he's fast and that he has that entry ability. Um, I'm just, I'm just curious. Like this kind of threat, it reminds me of something like five CP uh, Estinian. That once you get everything set up, it's like this card's going to attack every turn and and uh, it's going to win the game. But this seems way harder to set up. Um, yeah, but at least Obstinian it gets that. had built in haste if you had five backups, and he could attack twice in a turn. Whereas, yeah, again, he's got to choose an active for it. It's not just choose a for it. It's yeah. got to be an act. Like, there's just so many parts to this one. You know, Stinian mm -hmm. kind of had a simple: you got five backups, go to town. I just this feel like they had... they fill the same role, but like if you were playing a lightning water deck, you could you could uh, like I don't know. I, I guess I guess Astinia needed lightning backups, but still, yeah, this seems it seems like a lot of work. So I, I'm I'm uh, on the fence about this one for sure. We love comments for anyone, but this one in particular. If you have comments or ideas yeah. about this card, I would love to hear them because I, I, this is one of the ones I'm just like I have no clue what to think. Put about us it. in our place. <laughs> okay, next up we've got Freya, which is a 2CP Lightning Water Forward Job Dragoon. Uh, category 9, when Freya enters the field, choose one of the two following actions. Uh, draw one card and then discard one card from your hand. Uh, and then also uh, choose one active forward, deal at 4,000 damage. So this card is pretty, pretty cool um, in that it's part of the new direction that Final Fantasy 9 can go into which is into lightning uh, so it's definitely going to want nine characters still so that's good uh, and then overall though it's kind of like Leon in that this is like these are interesting utilities but I don't know how needed they are it's weird that the, the thing I find most like 
cool about this card is her name, her category, and her job. Yes, like, I yeah. I don't even care about any of the other effects, but and the fact that that nine deck that this card gives you, hey, now I've got a card that can get the puck because I can pitch the lightning and pitch the water. So yeah, it, it's weird. Her effect like is almost meaningless to me. I just like all those other parts of her. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, and then then she can be played off puck, which is very cool. And and this also bridges the two dragoon colors, which is lightning and water. So uh, there's definitely some cool stuff here. Okay. All right. Moving on to our last multi-element combo uh, is water fire. This is uh, Gawain. He is a four cost, five thousand power forward. Job knight, category FFL. When Gawain enters the field. You may search for up to one fire job knight other than card named Gawain and up to one water job knight other than card named Gawain and add them to your hand. Great, great, great on entry effect. Any card like this that basically replaces itself, you know, especially if you can tap this off of four backups, put them down, boom, pull out fire water, which we're going to see two more coming up that fit right in with this, um, as well as... I'm not 100% familiar with the knights, so I don't know all the targets he can get, but I know he can get that new Beatrix. Um, if there's any fire knights, he'll be able to grab those. He'll be able to get, grab copies of rain, that fire rain, to use on the light rain specials. Like, yeah, in a knight's deck, it, it, again, especially, and this is one of those cards, too, that he, he's only going to get stronger the longer the game goes mm -hmm. on, because surely they're going to print other fire or water knights as the game goes on, which means he's just got more and more targets to fetch out. Great card for that archetype. Yeah, you almost think that this would have been mandatory. You have to search both to make it yeah. more hard or difficult. But like, he's actually still a really good value if you just search one. Yeah. <laughs> Let alone if you search two. So, uh, just tremendous support for knights. Uh, I guess the tough part is fitting them in because there's just so many knights. There's so many choices. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think this type of searcher, there's no way you can't play him. Yeah. Okay. And then speaking of knights, we've got. Uh, Steiner, he's a 2 CP fire water forward job knight category 9, 7k power, so he's above curve. How nice. Uh, when Steiner enters the field, select one of the two following actions. All the forwards you control gain 2,000 power till the end of the turn. I like that one. Uh, and then uh, choose one forward of cost three or less your opponent controls, uh, and then bounce it. Send it packing. And I think this is the coolest uh, common one because I feel like those in a knight's deck those are two really nice utilities to have that power boost for your big board to go in for a giant swing uh, and then the other one is uh having bounce but with the bounce cards it's like if i don't want to bounce things then i just have this card and i'm like Ugh. but then if you have steiner you could do something else with him and then you can bounce if you need to but if you don't need to you don't have to and then if you play him he's a 2 cp 7k Ovelia is going to give him another thousand power like he's fine he's so he's good on like it's specifically in knights he's good in so many ways uh the the biggest problem is that he's steiner uh, and you you probably yeah. want to play the uh this there's a steiner that's going to search your backups it's going to search beatrix for you like that's just so good yeah but man if he had beatrix on the field you drop this guy everything gets four thousand power yeah. Like, woo, that's a big old board. Yeah, he's cool. For the commons, I like him, and I, I love your point about the bouncing, too, that when you have this kind of versatility of you can bounce if you need it, but you're not locked into that, that's really cool. Great card. Absolutely. Okay, take us home. All right, take us home, baby. This is, we were one, this was like, the, this was the last multi-element legend to be revealed, and I was wondering, I was like, we, there was a five theme to this set, Neo X Death was the dark, there was a Bart, so we're like, who's the light legend going to be? Is going to be another Bart? Ended up being Lena. So who's the only person we're missing from that original five crew? That's Ferris. Ferris is a 4 CP, 8,000 power forward, job warrior of light, category five. When Ferris or a job warrior of light forward enters your field, select one of the two following actions. Choose one forward, deal it 2,000 damage for each job warrior of light forward you control. During this turn, the cost required to cast your next Job Warrior of Light is reduced by two, cannot become zero. Fantastic Amano artwork. Again, I play a lot of Warriors of Light. I don't think even I can truly appreciate how good this card is mm -hmm. until like, it use it. But but the way it reads is like, that, that deck has ways to just crap forwards out. The Refia will automatically bring out one of the other Anthems. Like, 
Aegis is going to bring out somebody for free. So you can be doing some pretty big board nukes. And it's not just on her entry. It's anytime someone comes in. Or if you don't have anything you want to nuke, why don't you just make everything cheaper? Oh, and in case you didn't notice, that's a job warrior of light. That mm -hmm. means the backup. So that backup Sarah, yeah, you can cut her cost down. And you can do it multiple times. Like if you had two warriors, if Ferris was on the field and you played Aegis into something... You can then play that Sarah for two CP because you can cut her down. Like, it's crazy. There's so much potential here. This is one of those cards. It's nice to have another threat that's like, hey, uh, you better get rid of this card. Otherwise, it's just going to make your opponent snowball out of control. And best of all, it's water fire, which is predominantly what Warriors of Light is strongest in already. So she doesn't like color clash or anything. That's great. Yeah fantastic card it's going to be tough deciding what to cut to get her in there but she's going in there and i just oh, can't wait to try her absolutely i think uh i think it's gonna have a whole nother layer to like of risk removing that mobius light wall because you know when you kill him it's gonna bring back a three cp warrior of light and then that's going to trigger Ferris. Like it already was hard enough removing him because you were worried about oh, another warrior light coming in. But now you have to think about triggering Ferris too. Uh, I think you can set up some pretty nice board states where your opponent doesn't want to remove much because they're just scared of all the, the, the things that can happen. And uh, I think this card is like perfect because it's so strong, but it's 4 CP and it's AK. And then the the drawback is the multi-element in that uh, in an already crowded deck of many elements, paying for a multi-element could be tricky. Uh, but I, I think ultimately it won't be. But I think that's just where it's like, it's kind of fair. Like it's not going to be set up yeah. right away. Like this might be hard to play turn one, depending on your opening draw. So like it's just seems like really cool that way. Yeah, Warriors of Light is a fun deck I enjoy, but it's not really a thing. It's not really competitive. But as Edge dragged ninjas into comp competition last opus, I'm hoping, and I wouldn't mm -hmm. be surprised, if Ferris dragged Warriors of Light into, oh, no, you're, we're serious now. Like, deal with us, though. So. You're helping. Great card to end on. Yeah, and you know what I want to do? So I want to do two things. Is First, I want to talk about, you know... Uh, what we think of the power of these cards and then two i want to i want to comment on uh, what do you think the uh like how big is the drawback of you had a video about this about multi-element cards like I is did. it as hard as we think or easier than we think or like we're, i think that's going to be important to find out what the speed of these cards really are because there's going to be some games where if you're locked out of cp you're not going to be able to play one for a while so uh yeah it's gonna be interesting <laughs> you can check out my YouTube channel, The Modern Marvels. Um, I have a video talking about multi-element with my buddy Brandon, but same thing here. So it's clear to me that the designers think the flaw of that these cards must be paid with one CP of each element. They think that's a big holdback because all these cards are above curve. They all have a lower cost to their power ratio. So it's clear they think that's a big drawback. I gotta be honest though, I don't really think that is, especially because these cards can be pitched for CP of any element. I mean, that's crazy. Like even in a, a dual color deck with a 25, 25 ratio, I've been CP locked plenty of times. So to have a card that, oh no, this covers either or, it kind of worries me. It makes me wonder like, like are these an auto include? Like if you're running fire ice, do you put Bane in there just for the fact that you have a card that can be fire or ice? That no. seems really strong. <laughs> you don't think so? So so I think that's really powerful that they do that with the discard. Um, I don't think like if you were so worried about color fixing, then you should play a cosmos or something uh, or a chaos. Uh, if that's really your concern, because I think like having the vein in your hand at the right time to like do either CP, like that's solved by deck composition and testing numbers, not, but not by having a multi-element card. I think it's very useful and I think that's really powerful, uh, but I don't think you'd put it in for just that. And so I'm not really, what I'm really wondering about is, is paying for them, not like how powerful they are discarding, but like paying for them and how tricky that could be. Um, Cause I can think of many games playing a two element deck where somebody zidane's the you're playing earth lightning and so you have you've just drawn earth backups so you have two down or three down and someone takes that lightning backup from you or uh, someone hecatonk here is the earth only earth backup you have on the field uh, and then there's the games where 
you just don't see them. And that that again is class comp or uh, deck composition and how you um, how you play the game and prioritize getting these multicolor backups down. Uh, but I, I just feel like you know if you have a dead turn where you're locked out of playing a card, then that could be catastrophic. So I think I think that's why the power level is higher on them. If sure, that makes sense. I, I can see that's what they think. I just don't think. In my opinion, mm. I think they're underestimating how big of a drawback that will be because as someone who played a lot of through the Opus 11 meta online with Tyro and all the Moogles, like color fixing has never been easier. People are, are playing three elements and on tons of decks. Um, so I just don't think that's going to be a big issue. I think the ones that will really hold back are the two CP guys because, you know, most TC two CP forwards, you pitch a single card and put them down on the yeah. field. These guys, you can't. You actually kind of need to tap them off your backups because that's going to be way inefficient if you're throwing away two cards just to get this guy out there. Like, um, So the, I think the two CPs, are, especially if you drew those early, those mm -hmm. could really hurt you. Because, yeah, you don't want to have to pitch two cards from hand to get a two CP guy out there. So I'm of the mindset that I think they're underestimating. Um, I, I think the flaw of having to pay two is going to be easily overcome. I would be happy to be wrong about that. Mm -hmm. Maybe they, these things are going to be perfectly balanced. Um I think they're going to be on the strong side, personally. Yeah, I, well, I definitely think they're strong. I, I do think that uh, that we're going to see some some tough hands for sure. Uh, so I guess I'm somewhere in the middle. You're you're more on the it's not a huge drawback. I'm in that it's probably not as big as they think, but I still think it would be a drawback. Uh, hmm. So I, you know that's, that's close. That's close. Uh, okay, so then overall, uh, I guess we kind of answered this though. That we just think these are really powerful cards, like all, all, absolutely, yeah. Well, and like, it, it's a brand new mechanic introduced to the game. Again, we've never had a mechanic that, hey, this card has to be paid with CP of different elements, and that this card itself can be pitched for CP of two elements. So, it's a brand new mechanic. So we're just, you know, maybe when monster, like when monsters were first introduced way back in Opus Four, we'll just have to see. It's going to require testing and play time to really see. Um, what it brings to the table and how balanced it is or unbalanced or whatever else it is. So yeah, that, there's definitely an excitement about it, but there's just, you know, we can theory craft all day long, but there's some stuff you just don't really know and yes. you get it in yeah. your hands and you test it out. So yeah, this is going to be, I think one of the most fun topics to revisit in a, in a while, maybe like two or three weeks of playing with the cards. And then we say, you know, like, okay, in the end, how many times have I had, have I been locked out of car playing cards because I didn't have my CP set up? Or how many times right. is it where we can say it like it never happens, it's always fine. Like that'll be great yeah. to talk about. Um, okay. Well then that's it. That's gonna be it for our Yay. Opus 12 set review. And I appreciate everybody watching uh, and commenting. So uh, thank you so much for that, you guys. And thank you so much, Travis, for coming and joining me once again. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Absolutely, Alex. I, I always look forward to these and I have a great time. So thanks for having me on and putting up with my puns and everything else. Yeah, uh, everyone, I, enjoy enjoy Opus 12. I hope it I hope it treats everybody really well. I just want to say I just had this uh, thought in my head that, you know, me and you kind of party attacked this set review, if you think about it. So nailed it. Yeah, nailed it. that's the <laughs> that would be like a cool pod if we ever did like a podcast, just like the party attack. The party attack? That's a great the idea. FFTCG podcast, the party right attack. In. No one steal that. If someone starts up a podcast called the party attack, I'm coming for you. I tell you right now. Uh, yeah, okay, well, thank you so much for watching, guys. We'll we'll see you soon enough. I think once we've played with these cards for a while, we're, we'll be coming up with more videos. Um, so yeah, we'll see you soon. And thanks again. Enjoy Opus 12. See ya.